thanks, ironically, thanks to the pandemic, all of a sudden I had a whole year to write the book instead of the three months that they originally gave me to write it. But everything shut down and their schedules went out the window and so I had enough time and it took a full year of following my wife's schedule every day to write this book. <clears throat> I started with a list of 200 plants that I knew had medicinal uses that grow in California and I had to whittle it down to 70. That was a long process in itself because there were a lot of valuable herbs there that didn't fit my criteria which were among other things number one is there enough of that plant growing in California to ethically send people out to collect from it is there enough evidence of the uh, what scientists call empirical evidence the use of the plant over time trial and error um, to justify calling it a medicinal herb and then on top of that if it meets that criterion is there enough scientific evidence to show that it does have what it takes to be a medicinal herb? So those were the three main criteria I was looking at that I used to get it down to 70. And then there were other herbs like dandelion, for example, that are in so many books about herbs. It's a weed that grows all over the whole country. They'll let the other books take care of that. I'm gonna cover some that you're more likely to find just in California. So that was that process. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then because one of the uh, taglines, as it were, of the pandemic was follow the science, we all heard that, right, the debates about, and so I, I, that forced me to really dig into the science, which was the pharmacological studies on plants. Do they have alkaloids, do they have terpenes, do they have flavonoids that are shown in the laboratory to be able to treat a virus, to relieve pain, to uh, soothe inflammation, whatever. Um, <clears throat> and that is what ended up creating a much thicker book than the publishers had in mind, but they were very gracious in working with me on that. Uh, I also said, if I'm going to say that these plants are medicinal, and talk about studies, I really should have a citation mm. to the back of the book that if people want to verify that study for themselves, there's somewhere they can go. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we don't do citations in a field guide. You know, that's like a textbook thing, you know, an academic book. I said, well, for this one, we're going to have to do it. So they, they relented and agreed to do that. And then I, uh, they wanted me to also provide all the photographs. And this is a book for the whole state of California. Some places I don't get to very often. So I had to enlist 40 photographers, friends and acquaintances, and some I met online to provide the photos, which I'm very happy with because my, my complaint about many field guides is the photos are not clear enough to really identify the plant just from that. Now, today we have the benefit of the internet. So my book includes for each plant the current and most recent scientific names for the plant, which is what you need to plug in exactly spelled right into the internet to go look up other photos to verify the photos that are in here. Because you've got to make a positive ID to be sure you're looking at the right plant. That's number one if you're going to try to go out and collect plants. Uh, and on that note, my book also talks about what I call sustainable collecting which means following the legal side of where you can collect and also the, the ecological, ethical side of how do you harvest from a plant so that you're not uh, degrading the plant and uh, demeaning the experience that the next hiker is going to have, etc. So I would like to read, uh, unless there are any questions so far on what I've said. Are all so the plants far? native? Or they are not. Um, uh, <clears throat> most of them are native mm. uh, because I wanted plants that are uniquely found on the trails of California. But there were uh, a few, uh, let's see, what's a good example? Uh, uh, nettles. Uh, I have two species of nettles in the book uh, that are found in California. One is the dwarf stinging nettles that comes up 
in where you don't pretty much it. everybody's <laughs> vegetable garden and yard. How many of you are gardeners that have found stinging nettles in your yard? Okay, well, but we also have a giant creek nettle that you have to go up in the mountains into the creeks to find. And that grows like this tall with giant leaves and much bigger, stingier stingers on the nettle leaves. Uh, so I have both of them in the book. I have eucalyptus in the book because it's such an iconic California tree, even though it's considered an invasive by most ecologists. It's from Australia. It sucks up water from natives, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it's an internationally known valuable medicinal plant that I felt belonged in the book. So most of them are natives, and many of them are found here in Santa Barbara because Santa Barbara is on the cusp of Central California and Southern California. So you have a great diversity of plants right here in Santa Barbara. Possibly the most diversity you'll find in California. I mean, mm -hmm. I haven't thought about it that way, but it, it could very right. well be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have, you know, you have plants found by the ocean, like Yerba Mansa. You have plants, if you go over, over the hill here, and you'll find Yerba Santa uh, in the Chaparral region, so quite a bit. Oh yeah, so thank you. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so part of the process of writing the book uh, leads to this passage I'd like to read. And it was to answer the question that I assumed would come along at some point. If these are medicinal herbs, how come my doctor doesn't prescribe them? How come they're not in the drugstore if they're medicinal? Well, there's a reason for that. There's a history there. And I knew sort of knew that history, but I didn't know, I hadn't taken the deep dive into that history, which I took to write this book. And I discovered nobody else had written this history, except for a couple of obscure academic journal articles about this particular piece of history. So I thought it was really important to put in the book. And I was sure, because it named some names of the entities responsible for this travesty, I was sure that the publisher's lawyers would kick it back and say, we can't publish this, too controversial. But they didn't. And now it's going on YouTube, I think, isn't it? Uh, so on YouTube. So I'd like to read, with your permission, this short chapter. One of the sections in the front that you could sit down and read, you know, from sort of from inner cover to inner cover. And then the rest of the book is intended to look at each individual individual plant. So this section is called A Brief History of Medicinal Herbs in America. It's on page five, if you have your book with you. <clears throat> in 2012, researchers studying dental calculus on the teeth of 50,000-year-old Neanderthal skulls in a Spanish cave made a surprising discovery. They were looking for and finding evidence of the plant foods that made up the diet of early humans. But they also found remains of two not very tasty plants, chamomile and yarrow, known today as medicinal herbs. The researchers suggested that self-medication is the best explanation for this finding. It is highly likely that as long as humans have inhabited the earth, we've used herbs for self-healing probably from observing animals such as bears do the same. Today, the World Health Organization estimates that 60% of the world's population and 80% in developing countries rely on herbal medicines for their primary health care. As humans evolved, indigenous tribes created their own localized herbal medicine traditions based on trial and error and passed down orally. At the same time, two major herbal medical systems developed, one in India and one in China, that are still in use today. The Ayurvedic system of herbal medicine in India was first described in writing about 3,500 years ago and may have been developing for thousands of years before that. It continues today uninterrupted with practitioners around the world. The earliest recorded Chinese pharmacopoeia, or catalog of medicines, the Pen Sao Ching, dates back to the second century AD, but is thought to be based on thousands of years of oral teachings. The Chinese plant medicine system continues to this day in the form of traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM, practiced by acupuncturists, acupuncturists and doctors of oriental medicine worldwide. 
a different story unfolded in Europe, where for thousands of years, in the absence of a unifying system, folk healers, mostly women, treated people with local herbs. Those herbalists whose remedies worked gained followers and apprentices. Herbal knowledge spread by word of mouth. Meanwhile, a more formal herbal medical tradition evolved in Greece around the writings of two physicians, Hippocrates, known as the father of medicine, and Dioscorides, who wrote the first Western pharmacopoeia. In the early days of the Roman Empire, another Greek physician and author, Galen, used his newfound knowledge of anatomy and physiology to become the emperor's physician. His teachings, which dominated Western medicine for more than a thousand years, and that's all of Western medicine, not just herbal medicine, included complex and expensive herbal formulas because he worked for the king, as opposed to the single herb remedies of the folk herbalists known as simples. After the fall of Rome, the European tradition of plant medicine was squelched by the Catholic Church and replaced with religious beliefs about the source and treatment of illness. Throughout the Dark Ages, local herbalists continued their work in secret, often paying for their, quote, witchcraft, unquote, with their lives. Meanwhile, monks in monasteries transcribed the Greek medical writings. Their manuscripts fueled a renewed interest in herbs when the Renaissance blossomed in Europe in the 1500s with a flurry of lavishly illustrated books called herbals. The result today is an ongoing European interest in time-honored plant medicines. North America was an entirely new frontier for Western herbal medicine. The English and other European settlers in the eastern part of the continent and Spanish missionaries and pioneers in the West brought an assortment of herbs and recipes with them from their homelands. They soon discovered that indigenous tribes already had well-developed medical traditions based on herbs they gathered, cultivated, or acquired through trade. Native American herbal remedies and healing practices have been tested in the crucible of time for thousands of years. Unfortunately for the future of American medicine, most of the indigenous knowledge was lost as tribal lands were overrun in what can only be described as a genocide. Furthermore, a racist bias prevented most Europeans from accepting medical advice from people they deemed to be inferior, or even worse, subhuman. A few early American physicians did, however, value indigenous medicine, <clears throat> aided by the observations of pioneering anthropologists and ethnographers who recorded American Indian healing pr practices, these physicians began to establish a uniquely American brand of medicine com by combining European and Native American herbalism. They wrote books and started medical schools, practicing what was known as eclectic medicine, physiomedical therapeutics, and naturopathy, mm -hmm. among other names. These schools and the doctors they produced rode a wave of popularity that was peaking in the late 1800s and early and into the early 1900s. This promising evolution came to a halt in 1910 with the release of Medical Education in the United States and Canada by, Al by Abraham Flexner, now known as the Flexner Report. Commissioned by Andrew Carnegie, and funded by John D. Rockefeller, the report was promoted as a scientific attempt to assess the unregulated state of medical education in the United States, which was indeed in need of improvement. <laughs> while, at the same, while at the time it seemed a worthy philanthropic cause for the public good, today's historical perspective reveals another possible motive. Carnegie, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and other millionaire industrialists and bankers of their day were invested in oil and mineral extraction, mm. which produced the ingredients used in place of plants by the fledgling pharmaceutical industry to create synthetic chemical drugs. The Rockefeller fortune soon became heavily invested in the pharmaceutical industry and remains so to this day. The Flexner report resulted in the elimination of more than half the existing medical schools including those who taught herbal or naturopathic medicine 
as well as those who trained black or women doctors. Schools that survived and became accredited were the beneficiaries of generous funding by the Rockefeller Foundation. Similar changes already underway in the U.S. Pharmacopoeia, the USP, picked up steam after the Flexner Report. Following the isolation of morphine from the opium poppy in 1805, a few years before then, whole plant drugs were gradually replaced by laboratory versions based on a plant's, quote, active constituent, unquote. This so-called biomedical approach focused on one isolated component while overlooking the synergy of the many compounds found in a whole herb. In the first USP published in 1820, 70% of the drugs listed were derived from plants. By the 11th edition of 1936, the number had dropped to 45%. Between 1870 and 1970, the total number of plant-derived drugs in the USP fell from 636 to 68, while hundreds of synthetic compounds were added. This trend resulted in part from the inability of pharmaceutical companies to patent a whole plant. Ironically, the very word drug is derived from the old Dutch drogi, referring to dry herbs. Yet today, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, defines a drug as a substance recognized by an official pharmacopoeia or formulary, and secondly, as a substance intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease. The result is that even though many herbs have a history of use, and a few still exist in some form in the USP, they cannot be considered medical drugs unless they are approved by the FDA. Herbs are now placed in the regulatory category of dietary supplements. Since they cannot prescribe them, physicians do not learn about herbs in medical school, and pharmacists no longer learn about them in pharmacy school. In California, only licensed acupuncturists and naturopaths can prescribe whole herbs. The botanical medicines they prescribe will be found in their own herbal pharmacies or in retail health food stores, but not in medical pharmacies or drugstores. The legal status of medicinal herbs, or lack of it, did not stop American consumers from spending $8.8 billion on herbal supplements in 2018. And I'll add now, with the benefit of time, that number jumped 50% to $12 billion in 2020. Mm. Meanwhile, Native American community, communities continue to tap into their legacy of plant medicine. Hopefully, by bringing together the long-standing contributions of California Indians and the latest studies in plant pharmacology, this book will be able to play some part in restoring the status of medicinal herbs. At the same time, it may empower you, its readers, to learn how to identify and sustainably collect some common California herbs to create your own herbal pharmacy of home remedies. So yeah, I kind of spelled it out right there. The first time you will see that in a book, to my knowledge. When was that Flexner report? 1910. And it took about five years to have almost you know, nationwide effect. Because once the, once the schools uh, failed the test of the Flexner report, they couldn't get money. They couldn't get money. They couldn't get accredited. They started a new system of accrediting medical schools and they couldn't get accreditation. So why would you go to a meta school that couldn't give you an MD mm -hmm. license? So they disappeared overnight. Yeah. Like a couple wow. of years, they were gone because their enrollment went to nothing. How did you make this your life work? Well, uh, <clears throat> it, it, there is an origin story there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little personal, but I will share it. Uh, I, I was first introduced to the whole concept of medicinal herbs visiting a, a Pueblo Indian reservation in 1967, where I got a cold and an older man brought me a bag of tea and I drank the tea, I followed his instructions and my cold went away. So that piqued my curiosity. So 
When I came back to Santa Barbara, I went to the library. I found the only book I could find on herbs, which was Back to Eden by Jethro oh, yeah, Kloss. <laughs> a classic, but all based on eclectic medicine of the East Coast. Yeah. So very few plants that you find in California. So I started looking for people to study with. And I found an herbalist in, right in, I was living in Santa Barbara at the time. And then I, I discovered Juanita Centeno, my, my Chumash teacher. And at the same time, uh, I had become also equally involved in studying Native American religion, Native American culture, spirituality, medical uses, etc. And uh, I went on a self-styled vision quest in the mountains above Ojai. And I had a vision. A plant spoke to me. And it was kind of like, I think of it now because the Lorax is the same idea, the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which I don't know when that was written, but I think it was after I realized that I was supposed to speak for the plants, to uh, protect the plants from destruction of development in the backcountry and elsewhere. And I realized not long after that, as I started leading these walks, that the way that you save the plants is by instilling in people a sense of value in all that green stuff you see up on the hillsides. Some people look at it and they see where a pad could go for a house and where the driveway could go up to the pad. Mm. I look up there and I see all these medicinal plants and edible plants and plants that are part of the ecosystem that feeds the insects and the birds and the butterflies. So that became my personal mission to represent plants uh, in that way. Mm. And that began my really deep dive into this. And once I dove in, it's the kind of study that it just gets deeper and deeper, like down the rabbit holes. I, did that answer your question? Yes. Good. How long have you been doing like the, the walks and public programs? The walks I started in 1976. So 40, I'm in my 46th year of that. They're good walks for anyone that has yeah. a walk. They're amazing. For the camera and everybody, if you can yeah. talk a little bit about, about your walks. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, thank you. So. Um, this is my business card. I still have these, but I also have a website that's on here on the business card. It's herbwalks.com. That's easy, herbwalks.com. And you will see I uh, have a colorful photographic website with an ongoing schedule of coming events. I just led a walk this morning uh, for members of the uh, Land Trust for Santa Barbara County. And I will be doing other walks in Santa Barbara. I have a walk coming up this summer at the um, Carpinteria Salt Marsh. And I always go to Arroyo Hondo Preserve yes, several times a year, but right now it's closed because of the fire. But I just was doing a hike for the stewards of that land and they said it's gonna open up again in May. Mm. So I should be back there this summer looking at the regeneration of the landscape after a fire, which is remarkable. I mean, look at the hills here now. You remember what they looked like if you lived here in, in the spring of 2018. Mm -hmm. ash and black sticks so it's it's remarkable how nature comes back there's a lot for us to learn from plants about resilience about regeneration so that's going to be the focus when we go up to Royal Honda this year that's great so herbwalks.com so you actually included recipes in here mm -hmm. and I'm really glad you did and wondering why you decided to do that and also which, why you picked the ones that you selected? Uh, well, I felt like um, each, each plant has some basic instructions to prepare a tea or a simple preparation. Mm -hmm. But I also felt like it would be good to have just a little section of recipes. And I would have liked to have a lot more recipes, maybe one for every plant. But I had already stretched the limit of how thick of a book they were gonna go with. And they have parameters like how many pages you can divide by four and all sorts of things like that. And that's what they came up with. And so it was a, a challenge to fit it into this format. So hopefully it'll continue to sell and there will be a second edition. Where mm -hmm. we can, I can correct some of the little errors that hopefully nobody else notices, but <laughs> I notice, mm -hmm. or things that I could have worded a little differently and uh, and more recipes. Well, I think this book has a lot of staying power, though. I think this is going to be one of our 
better consistent sellers throughout the year. I hope so. Thank you. So we appreciate you coming and thank you very much right. to you and Rondia for Thanks. coming out here. So yeah. thank you everyone. Thank you all for coming.